I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, where we discuss the ideas, people, and events that have made America what it is today. We believe that by understanding our history and our principles, we can better live up to the promise of the American founding and preserve our ongoing experiment in self-government. Welcome to The American Idea. Well, I want to welcome everyone to this very special episode of The American Idea. You know, we talk a lot about on this podcast about American principles, uh, about American history, current events. And one of the things we always say is that an important part of America and the American Idea is the freedom to flourish and govern ourselves. And sometimes we don't talk a lot about what we mean by flourishing. Uh, I think we all understand that it has some connections to excellence and to being excellent in all ways that we can. And I wanna to talk today about a really important, interesting topic. How do you create and sustain excellence in an organization? Whether that excellence, whether that organization is a business, whether it's a country, or maybe in this case, whether it's a team. And we're gonna be, I'm joined for that conversation today by, um, you know, I, I've interviewed and spoken in the conversations with vice presidents, secretaries of state, U.S. senators, but I've never been nervous until this episode today <laughs> because I am with a very, very special person who knows a lot about excellence, and that is Coach Carrie Pickens. For those of you who don't know, uh, Carrie is the head coach of the Ashland University women's basketball team. And you might say, well, why do you have her on the show? Well, the fact is, this is one of the finest collegiate basketball programs in the country, uh, whether you measure it by the quality of and character of the players and the staff, or whether you measure it by wins. Carrie Pickens knows a lot about winning. In two seasons as an Ashland University player, she scored 1,414 points. She was Division II Female Athlete of the Year. She was assistant coach for the university's team where she won a national championship. She has been head coach since 2018-19. And in that time, if you can imagine this, she has compiled a record, including this season, of 169 wins and 16 losses, at least by my count, <laughs> and two undefeated seasons, national championships that she's been a part of in 2013, 2017, and 2023. And I might add, was undefeated and would have won the national championship in 2020 had COVID not intervened. Um, the university's team is 27 and one this year. And to put it in perspective for some basketball fans, only South Carolina's women's team has an equivalent record over the last two years. We are honored to have you with us today, Carrie, on The American Idea. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Um, uh, some of folks, our listeners may not know you. We have listeners around the world, around the country. Tell us a little bit uh, if, to start about your journey uh, to where you are now as the Ashland University women's head coach. So I grew up in a basketball family. So basketball has kind of been in my uh, genetics from when I was a very young girl. Both of my parents were Hall of Fame basketball players in high school and at the collegiate level. And um, I had a ball in my hand from as time I could walk, essentially, my mom coached. And so I was always uh, running around a gym. Uh, what's funny, though, is I always grew up having this illusion that in order for me to um, succeed or to have success, I needed to play at as high of a level as I could at the Division One level. There was uh, I vividly remember a time where I was stuck in a not stuck. My parents and I went to a Panera and I had played really poorly at a game and uh, I started crying to them and asking if they thought I was going to have to play division two basketball rather than division one. And it's really funny for me to look back on that now being a division two coach um, that I never thought I would want to play at the division two level, let alone coach at the division two level. But I think that the life and the balance that the division two level has is something that really uh, kept drew me here and kept me here. Um, and then I just, I love the game of basketball. That's one of the things that I've learned over the years is 
there are some people who like basketball and they do it more just for the friendships and everything. I love basketball. And part of my job as a coach is, yes, absolutely, to help mentor my student athletes. Um, but I also love the X's and O's, um, trying to play the game of chess uh, within basketball. Uh, and so it's been a real challenge for me that I've loved the opportunity to be able to have here at Ashland. Tell us a little bit about your time. First, as a player here, you were, of course, a player under a pretty legendary coach herself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so Sue Ramsey is the head coach who recruited me here after I transferred away from the University of Dayton. Uh, she was tremendous. She was actually uh, the first real strong woman of faith that I had encountered, which is the biggest reason that I came to Ashland to begin with was because I wanted to grow in my faith. And I thought that Sue Ramsey was really going to be able to help me to do so. And she absolutely did. She challenged me. She pushed me. And she really set a standard for um, just confidence in her faith that I had never really seen in a person before. And it gave me a lot of confidence to do so as well. Uh, but obviously, I played here for two years. Uh, I met my husband here. And then we actually went over to Australia for me to play professionally for a season before I came back here. And Yet again, Coach Ramsey made a way for me to be here. There wasn't really a position open for me. She went out and fundraised for me to have uh, a, a stipend that I could be on staff for for a season. And then after Coach Ramsey left, it was in line for Robin Freilich to hire me as her assistant. And then when Robin stepped away, I was um, honored to be given the opportunity be to become the head coach. What's the most valuable lesson you learned as a player from Coach Ramsey? I would say the two, if I could narrow it down to two, because there's a lot to take away. She's a huge mentor for me. Um, the first one is to always fight for your people. Uh, she, there was never a task, never anything too big that would keep Coach Ramsey from standing up and fighting for her people if she believed that that's what she needed to do. Uh, like I said, she created a position for me when there was not one uh, because she knew the, what she wanted to have happen for her program and she wanted me to have the opportunity to be a part of it and so fighting for your people and then the second thing that coach Ramsey always did was she never let her highs get too high or her lows get too low and in a profession where there are a lot of emotions there's a lot of people in the stance who want to tell you exactly how you're supposed to be doing things all these different kinds of things <laughs> right I've sat next to some of those people <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was always so steady. She never really, she never got rattled. Uh, she was always consistent. And I think that that was something really important for me to take away from her and something that I can hopefully bring for my players as well. How about with coach Freilich? She's now, as you said, gone on, she's now coaching at Michigan state university uh, in the big 10. What'd you learn from Robin? To never be afraid to change if you need to. She took over a program that, had been very, very successful. And she came in and she, after her first year, decided to do an entirely different defense. Uh, and that kind of became her identity as a coach. Very aggressive. We pressed the entire game. We had never done anything like that before. And she really, she always gave the team permission to do what was best at that time. Uh, things change, things evolve, and you have to be willing to take the steps necessary to put your to put your team in the best position possible to be successful. And so for me, I feel like I'm oftentimes quoting things that Robin would say in our huddles um, or just even our coaching staff, whether that's um, I just want the best players or we want uh, sometimes people get so analytical about different things and Robin kept it really simple. And so I oftentimes refer to her in those catch uh, in those catch lines that I say, but definitely not being afraid to change is the biggest thing I took away from her. Can we talk a little bit? Those are really those are really important lessons in thinking about sort of how you create a culture of excellence and then how you sustain it, mm. because you have obviously sustained the, the tradition that you inherited um, of excellence how do you work at sustaining excellence every day? So our program has a philosophy statement. Uh, we have a, within that philosophy, we have a, a mission statement, a 
four core values, a set of core values, and then a foundation statement. And I think for me, pursuing excellence is always referring back to those things. Uh, a lot of that philosophy has stayed the same from coach to coach to coach over the last 12, 13 years. Uh, but it's definitely I've made it my own, which is something that I took away from Robin is that you can't be afraid to change uh, a, a few parts but that foundation piece has stayed the same. And so for me, I'm always referring back to that. Whenever I'm recruiting, or if I'm making X's and O's decisions, everything that all of those decisions are always centered around, okay, is this decision going to help us be the best division two women's basketball team in the country and make a positive impact on all who cross our path? If that, if those decisions can follow that model, then I'm going to pursue it. And if it can't, then I'm going to have to take a step back. And so I feel like that's something I'm just constantly evaluating. Are the decisions that I'm making aligning with our philosophy, because our philosophy is supposed to be the guidelines of excellence that we hold ourselves to. Yeah, I've heard some people say the most important thing in his organization is getting the why right, mm -hmm. starting with the why, the mission, as you say, the philosophy. Um, and then I've heard some people say, and the next thing after the why and the mission is the who, the people. Mm. Um, tell me about what you're looking for if you're thinking about who I want around me as staff, who I want on my team as players, what kind of people are you looking for? Wow, that great insight. I love that quote as well. It definitely is the why and then the who, who you surround yourself with is, is huge. And so for me, for my staff, uh, the biggest thing that I am looking for are people that balance me well. I think that I have, as we all do, strong strengths in one set and then some strong weaknesses in another set. I think that I am an organized person. I think that I'm a fairly inquisitive person. I take time to evaluate things, but I need someone on the flip side of me who is a little bit more spontaneous, who keeps things fun and light and who is pretty straightforward uh, instead of always beating around the bush. Like I know I can sometimes do myself. I want someone who can honestly talk straight to me. Um, and so for me, finding that balance of strengths for my coworkers is something that's really important for me. And then in regards to my players, we actually have a pretty set standard of the type of players that we recruit. Um, they need to come from winning programs. That's something that I I think that when you come from a winning program, you have all of these intangibles that I don't have to spend time teaching when you get to the college level. You know how to work hard. You know how to play with other good players, those kinds of things. Uh, so recruiting from a winning program, a high character people, um, they need to be great teammates. They need to be great in the classroom, all of those kinds of things that kind of fall in line with that. And then you also need to be great at something. Uh, if you're going to play within our program, what are you going to stand out at? Um, if you're just average at a bunch of things, I can go and get someone who's going to outperform you in these things. And that person's going to step up to the plate. And so that those are kind of the three big things that we look for when we're recruiting a student athlete. I think talk a little bit more about recruiting and thinking about the characteristics, because obviously now that the program has become so prominent, you attract interest from a lot of young women players um, from around Ohio, maybe even around the region and the country. Um, some of these girls are probably used to being the very best player on their school and maybe the best player on every team they've ever been on. Mm -hmm. But then they get here and they might not be the best player. They might need to be part of the larger thing. How do you help them make that adjustment and get the best out of them? That's something that we start talking about early on in the recruiting process is a lot of times I refer to the stat lines of different players on our team. Um, the reigning GMAC player of the year and Annie Roshak, and she was the first female American. She averaged 15 points a game last year. Uh, a lot of players coming out of high school average close to 20 when they're ever, they're coming to Ashland. And so we kind of even start there um, that we, this on this, on our current team this year, only have two players in double figures. And then we have six players in between six to 10 points. And so uh, we really emphasize that if you want to come in as a freshman and score 20 points a game, Ashland's not the place for you uh, because we're a really well-balanced team. But if you want to be a part of a program where you can come in and help us compete for a national championship, then Ashland's where you want to go. So we try to, we try to really have those conversations early on so that people 
aren't shocked or as shocked. And it's never easy to go from playing all the time to maybe not playing what you typically want to play. But we've at least had some of those conversations early on so that people are ready to be bought into whatever their role is. Um, one thing I've heard someone, someone told me about you, um, and this was actually one of your players said to me, I said, tell me something special about Coach P. And they, she said, she just gets the best out of everyone. Mm. How do you do that? That was very kind of them to say. <laughs> um, in regards to trying to get the best out of everyone, uh, I love the saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so I think that as a coach, I really try to let my players know how much I care about them as an individual. And then we can talk about basketball. But until they know that I really care about them as a person and want what's best for them, and they're never really going to genuinely learn about the basketball things that I need them to learn. Maybe you could say a little bit more about your that very generous approach to people. You've talked a lot about um, the importance of your Christian faith in your own life. Mm. How does that shape how you interact with your staff, with your players in trying to get the best out of them? Yeah. So that's, I feel like something that I'm navigating through every single season of time is that um, I am a Christian and that's the most important thing in my life. Uh, but how do I live that out with my team without them feeling like I'm forcing it on them? Cause I never want that to be a blind blurred. Uh, but so how I kind of incorporate that is, um, so our foundation is done in love to be a light. And I believe that Jesus has taught us to um, love others really, really well. And then to let his light shine and other people would be attracted to that light. And so everyone's light looks uh, a little different when they come here, what, what they want their light to look like. I want my light to be the light of Jesus and that be what draws people um, in and to feel loved and comforted. And I want to be able to provide that for people. Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to take a moment and ask you to learn a little more about the Ashbrook Center and how you can help us continue our work with teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chad Kiefer, a Director of Philanthropy and Strategic Partnerships here at Ashbrook. At its heart, America's story is about the lives of patriots who have given their last full measure of devotion to preserve and protect what it means to be an American. But the tragic truth is that the American story is being rewritten as one of oppression and despair. Back in 1776, the founders took a chance when they created a new government built on principles of liberty. They took a chance on America. Now I'm challenging you to do the same. Your gift to Ashbrook today reaches students, teachers, and citizens across the country, helping them to understand why America is worthy of their devotion. With so many forces eroding our history and taking away from our principles, isn't it time we give America a chance? Your investment is encouraged now more than ever. Please visit us today at ashbrook.org backslash support. It's interesting. The other thing that I've heard people say about your team is when you get the best out of them, people have compared them. And I've heard them say this several times. That team plays like a pack of wolves. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, what's that? How do you have that generous spirit and sportsmanship that really does characterize your team? It's noticeable, but yet have that aggressive edge like a wolf pack. My goodness, that I love that compliment. I just I think we have we play really hard. So in our mission statement, it says that we are on are on a relentless pursuit. And that relentless pursuit is how we define success. Um, at the end of the year, whether we win a championship or not, if we can say that we relentlessly pursued the things that we wanted to pursue, then that was a successful season. And so I think that that's a big piece. Uh, we play 10 players on our team this year. And so uh, they better be fresh when they're going in. They better play really hard because whenever they step onto that court, there should be a relentlessness to them that other teams feel and quite frankly, don't want to have to play against again. Yeah, I, I, I've noticed in the games that I've watched of you, 
Uh, I've seen you lose games and not be very upset. The only time I've ever seen you upset is when it looked like your team was not being relentless. Mm. Yeah, thanks. That that is so true. A loss, right? You're just you're constantly telling a story. Whenever, um, when during throughout a course of a season, every game is like a new chapter that you're writing, and so in every chapter and every story, there are highs and lows. And so you can't ever get so bogged down by the highs and the lows that, that it wears on you so much over the course of the season. But what I do get upset on is that when the highs and the lows aren't falling in line with what our end goal is. And so as long as I felt like we were relentlessly pursuing something and maybe didn't, it didn't come out the way we wanted it to, that's okay. But if we aren't relentlessly pursuing something, I am going to have something to say about it. At the same time, it's interesting to me, I've seen a lot of basketball coaches, watched a lot of basketball games in person, TV, um, it's funny, I have an 11 year old daughter. She's gone to a lot of basketball games since she has occasionally turned to me and said, dad, why are basketball coaches, why do they always look so unhappy? <laughs> but <laughs> you don't always look so unhappy. How come? Oh, I love the game. I love the game of basketball and I love my team. They are such a fun group. Uh, that's one of the things I think that I always love asking coaches whenever I go to talk to them before the game, like how's the season going, all of these things. and there are some times where they're like, you know, it's a, it's been a tough year, but I really like my team. And I always try to encourage them that if you can really like your team, then you can do some good things because winning and losing is definitely a part of the game. That's what you're evaluated on from the outside perspective, but the impact that you can have on your team day in and day out and on the lives that you're impacting for the rest of their lives, not for just this season. Um, that means way more. And so you have, uh, I think you always just, again, going back to what Coach Ramsey taught me, your highs can't be too high and your lows can't be too low. It's about way more than the game of basketball. Have you ever had a, te a technical foul? No, I don't think I ever will. I, I will be shocked if I do. Because I'm a pretty mild-mannered person in general. You're not a yeller, right? No, I'm not. <laughs> not unless my team is just like not playing hard. Then I might lose it a little bit there. But What about um, as a coach? And maybe this is on the court, but maybe it's off the court. What's been one of the hardest moments for you? The hardest moment or timeline for me was navigating through COVID and then all of the political unrest that was also going on during that time frame. I felt like there was a lot of expectations and pressure from me to behave a certain way to say certain things, to believe certain things on both sides of the camp. And I really struggled with what to do in that time frame because to me, I'm I'm a I'm a basketball coach. Like I, I, I wasn't supposed to be standing up for one thing or another as a basketball coach, but the entire world around me I felt like was taking a stand on on something. Um kneeling or not kneeling, masks or no masks, uh, vaccines or no vaccines. Like there was just so much going on during this time frame that everyone had a very strong opinion about. And for me, knowing how to navigate that as a leader for my team was by far the hardest thing that I think I've ever had to go through. Mm. Uh, on the flip side, how, what's your greatest joy as a coach? I love player development. I think it's one of my favorite things as a coach is to work on something with a player on the court and then see it translate. And so some of my greatest joys has been, we've had some really good post players during my time here. We've had 14 All-Americans and 11 of them have been post players uh, during my time here at Ashland. And I think it's been really cool for me to see post players coming in pretty raw and not like they're big, they're athletic, they know how to do some good things, but to see them really develop as a basketball player over their four years here is I think been one of my greatest joys is I love coaching. I love helping players get better. And it's definitely about more than just basketball, but seeing it translate on the court is really, really special for me. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this is too much of a basketball question, but it's, I grew up watching eighties basketball. The post was a big thing. 
Mm -hmm. The modern game, it seems much less of that, but your team seems, especially this year, very post-oriented. Yes. Did you have to change the way that the young women think about the game? Oh, very much so. We have several girls come in and our guards in particular, our guards on our team have to be great passers and uh, shooters, like their skill, right? Skill is very much uh, a high priority for our team. And we have one of our girls on our team that was like, I was never allowed to throw a skip pass or a post pass during her time in high school. I was all dribble drive, which is a very common um model right now in the game of basketball and so it's definitely a mindset shift for a lot of them so do you feel like you're I mean people are zagging and you're zigging I think that we've played the style that we have long enough that teams in our region have adapted a little bit more based on what we've done so I think that we've seen a lot more teams try to make sure they have that big post player or try to make sure they have people who can um, try to draw our post players out of the paint a little bit more. So I think in our region, it's not as much, but when you face teams outside of our region, uh, well, our region is essentially West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, all of those schools. Once you get outside of our region, I definitely think that everyone's zigging and we're zagging, but for the present time, it's not as heavily noticed right now. Um, thinking about the title of this episode and particularly connecting it to your, I've heard you a number of uh, interviews talk about servant leadership mm. and the importance of that idea for you as a coach and what it means for your team. Can you talk a little bit about that idea of servant leadership? So our number one core value is be a great teammate. And then our foundation statement is done in love to be a light. And so whenever you put those together, I, I think it really embodies servant leadership in that anyone who's going to be on our team, being a great teammate is the number one core value that we have. Uh, but then not, not being a great teammate just because you're told to be a great teammate, but being a great teammate because you genuinely love your teammate. And I think that when you're operating out of love and operating out of a place of service, that servant leadership naturally falls into place. You have our seniors who, who want to carry the dirty laundry. You have seniors who want to be the first one into the gym and the last one out to make sure everyone's doing okay. Um, all of those characteristics you have, those upperclassmen, those seniors who want to love their teammates and serve in that way, that servant leadership is a natural byproduct from it. That's not a thing that's probably too um, fashionable in our culture. Mm. Probably not. But um, when I wrote our program philosophy, uh, done in love to be a light was something that was really, really heavy on my heart. Uh, while my program is not one where you have to be a Christian to be a part of it by any means, there are multiple girls on our team with in various walks of their life in terms of faith. Um, but I wanted people that if they were going to come here, they were going to experience through me, hopefully what the love of Christ looks like. And then through that journey, making sure that we had people who wanted to love others uh, as in that same way. So what have you thinking about now your time as a player, assistant coach, and now head coach, what have you learned from basketball that you take into your own life? Uh, first, it can't be all about you. Uh, being a wife and a mom to three children now, um, if every decision I made and everything was just always focused on me, then our family wouldn't be very healthy. And I think the same can be said for a team. Uh, decisions can't just be centered around one person. That working hard matters. My mom, so whenever, I love this story about my mom. I, I always love to share it whenever I have an opportunity when I was in third grade, I was on a traveling basketball team and uh, my aunt was my coach and there was a game that we played and I didn't get into the game. And afterwards we were in the car driving home and my mom, I started crying and my mom's like, Carrie, why are you crying? And I, of course, as a third grader would say, mom, I didn't get into the game. That's why I'm crying. Um, and she very lovingly, she always gets on me for saying she sounds mean, but she very lovingly told me, well, Carrie, you're just not good enough yet. 
you have to, if you want to, if you actually want to play, you have to get better. And if you don't want to put in the work, that's okay. You don't have to play basketball, but if you're going to do this, you have to work harder. And I think that that moment has really shaped me as an individual because success isn't going to just be given to you. You have to work really hard for it. And I think the game of basketball through a lot of years has taught me that. I think a lot of our listeners would love to know how you build those habits of excellence that got you from third grade to where you are now. What does a typical Carrie Pickens practice look like? Oh gosh, that's, it's so hard because at, during the time, what time of year it is um, versus if it's the day before a game. So I'll just take it back to early on, right? When there's not a ton of games, uh, a typical practice would look like we come in, we get warmed up, <clears throat> always important to get the mind, the body, everything ready to go. And then we have a time of connection where we call it our pre-practice connector. Every day there's a different connector. There's just a topic that we all go around and we talk about just to make sure that we're connecting a little bit more on an emotional level before we dive into the physical aspect of it. And then- Is that, um, is that connector about basketball or is no, it about- No, 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 just it? about life. So Mondays are minute Mondays. We all get around and we share just about the weekend. We hadn't seen each other for a couple of days. So what's going on in life? Tuesday is tough Tuesday. So everyone can share a hardship in life. Wisdom Wednesday are, um, is Wednesday. Everyone can share a nugget of wisdom. Thursday is thankful Thursday. Friday is funny Friday. Everyone can just share something funny, just touching base with each other. And then we also do spotlights each day. So we spotlight a core value every day as well. So if so, there's someone on the team who's been doing that core value well, that's also a time for us to spotlight that person. So once again, just connecting a little bit more on an emotional level. And then uh, we dive right into um, a, a lot of disciplines. I feel like in the game of basketball, if you can be great at disciplines within your offense and your defense, then it's going to carry over in a game setting. So we spend probably a half hour um, on just basic fundamental skill work. And then we build upon that into small group settings of really intense competing actions. And then usually at the end of practice for 15, 20 minutes, we do five on five competing action because while skill work and discipline and all of that's great and so fun at, at the end of the day, it's still a five on five basketball game and you have to be able to perform under those circumstances. So we try to work our way up into it, but then always end in a way that is going to be a live game setting. What's your hope for the program going forward? My hope for the program going forward, as cliche as this sounds, is that we can continue to be on a relentless pursuit to be the best division two women's basketball team in the country and make a positive impact on all who cross our path. I think that the players that we bring in, I want them to be able to experience that. And the players who leave, I want them being able to say that they fulfilled that experience during their time here. And so as long as we can keep doing that, I know I'm supposed to be coaching. If I ever stop doing that, then I feel like that's when my time has come to be done. But as long as we can keep striving towards that goal, um, I think that this is where I'm supposed to be. So this is an Ashbrook podcast. We are, we love history here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe this is an unfair question, but I got to ask if you have a favorite person in American history, maybe it's a sports figure, mm -hmm. maybe it's some other leader, who's your favorite person? I love history, by the way. I almost became a uh, high school history teacher. You I seem like a sound person. I'm not surprised. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Loved history. My favorite class by far was AP government in high school. Um, but someone talked me out of history. I went math and science instead. Anyway, history. My favorite person, I would say, is um, Harriet Tubman. Uh, there, I've loved, I love her story. There's a movie that was brought, we always learned about her, but there was a movie that was made about her not too long ago. And that just a lot of her characteristics uh, really resonated with me uh, and just her fight and her fearlessness to do the right thing, uh, no matter the circumstances was, it's really inspiring. And I think her faith is something that really grounded her too. Wow, wonderful. The power of mission, the power of discipline, the power of habit, the power of excellence. Carrie, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today on The American Idea. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, 
Remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.